OK. OK. Uh, thanks, everyone, for coming to our biotechnology seminar series. So today is uh, my pleasure to introduce Professor Gai Jini the, to give a talk. Professor Gai Jini received his uh, bachelor and master degrees from Case Western Reserve University. And then he got the PhD degree from Harvard University, working with Professor John Hutchinson. Professor Jini then uh, continued his postdoc research at the Cambridge University and Brown University, and also uh, work as the adjunct professor there. Professor Jini is the associate professor now at the Washington University at the St. Louis. He is working in the, the Department of Mechanical Engineering and Material Science, and also affiliated to the Department of Neuro Neurological Surgery. Professor Jini also holds visiting professorship at the Xi'an Jiao Tong University at China. He is well known for his research in the cellular, mineral, and the tissue mechanics at the Titan to the bone interface, or the insertion, the mechanical response of the brain to the school accelerations, and aspects of cellular membrane mechanics relevant to the HIV replication. Professor Jini published hundreds of papers in the prestigious journals of the mechanics and the biophysics area, including the annual review of biophysics, biophysical journal, and GMPS. He has received numerous awards and grants due to his great achievements. Today, Professor Jini will give the talk on the understanding and the controlling fibrotic myocardium. So please join us to welcome Professor Gai Jini. for a very well researched uh, introduction. Thanks very much to all of you, especially those of you who have come uh, early, uh, long before the food shows up, and to those of you in California who, uh, who aren't going to be able to partake of the champagne and bonbons that are stacked up outside the door. <laughs> so I, I'd like to, to talk about uh, some work in a relatively new area for us, which is, uh, which, is which relates to uh, cardiac fibrosis and hypertension. But I'd like to say just a couple words about the angle that we come at this from. And uh, so I'd like, to, I'd like to bear with you just for a few words of, of our philosophy. So th the idea is that we're interested in mechanics uh, applied to medicine. And, th and this is actually something from about the last decade. Almost all of the treatments we have in the hospital right now are from the marriage of biology and chemistry that really came, came to fruition in the 1960s. But that, that's really led to a, a model of pretty much any organism as this. And you can't actually see that, that, that uh, systems model, but it doesn't matter because they're all just Chinese hot pot. And, and the idea is that you, you take a bunch of stuff, you throw it together, and pretend it doesn't really matter what you're picking up and, and what you're hitting. And if, uh, if it's not good, you just call over your grandmother, she throws in some spices, but all of a sudden uh, the, the organism is healed. And, and that, that's been very effective, but uh, our belief is that the next generation of cures really has to start taking into account the fact that organisms are structures as well. There are many, I'm at a school of medicine, there are many problems that my colleagues tell me are insoluble from the chemistry perspective. Uh, an example is what Tang Shin and Tao work on, for instance, cancer, which is hopelessly multimodal uh, from the chemistry perspective, but from the mechanics perspective, there are just a few things that kill you. Your primary tumor almost never kills you. It's metastasis. So I don't work on that because Tan Shin and Tahir are already working on it. Instead, however, I do work on a host of other areas. We find that the, the real action, the real difference between life and death, cure and no cure, is usually at the interface between the cell and its environment. So when we study interfaces and adhesion in physiology and nature, we have a, a very broad program in this. Uh, I'm going to just focus on, on this area as well. It's a relatively new area uh, in, involving uh, it, how, ce how cells in the heart interface with their environment and how that can go horribly wrong. And we, ha we have a, a whole host of collaborators in all these areas. These are all uh, very large efforts. And, uh, and you know, I want to point out a couple of names before I get going. There's, there's, uh, there's, there's Shung Min Lee, who should be here as well, and Tracy Abney, two students who just recently graduated who, will, who have done most of the work 
that I'll present. And then uh, my colleague, Elliot Elson, uh, you see him all over these areas, uh, has been instrumental in developing some of the technologies that I'm going to talk about. Anyway, and th there are the names again. So now a couple of words about pathology is going to be the focus of the next couple of hours here. Just kidding. Um, so this is a heart, or half of a heart. And, it, it, and uh, Tahir, for instance, just ran over here. And so what happened to him? He, he, he was a little bit cold, but his, he, he, his, his, he's, he got a little bit hotter. He sweated. His heart rate increased. His blood pressure increased. And it's good for his heart. What happens is that the, the muscle cells, the cardiomyocytes, muscle cells in the heart, uh, end up taking on more muscle stress fibers. It gets stronger. And you can see that in the phenotype of the heart. And actually, I should mention before I go on, does anyone here actually have a weak heart? Is, is anyone here? OK. So I'm going to show you another example. Ready for this? OK. So what happens when you listen to this guy? <laughs> so the same thing happens. Your blood pressure goes up. You start sweating. Your, blood, your, your heart rate increases. But something very different happens to the heart. Instead of the heart getting stronger, you get something that looks like this. And, and what happens is that another type of cell of the heart, called a fibroblast, which is the most numerous cell in the heart, not the most voluminous, but most numerous cell of the heart, undergoes a conversion from this kind of quiescent state to a state in which it produces more extracellular matrix and then interferes, uh, possibly, with conduction uh, in the heart. So, so the, the extracellular matrix stiffens the heart. The, and, the, and then the presence of these myofibroblasts might actually uh, might cause conduction problems. And this can cause heart failure from, uh, for a host of reasons. So natural myocardium is a mess. It's been, it's been impossible to tease out what the mechanisms underlying uh, heart failure do to fibrosis are uh, just, just in natural myocardium. It's very dense tissue, highly vascularized, highly complicated. Our approach is to use a, a class of artificial tissues. These were invented in the late 1990s by my colleague, Elliot Elson, and a visitor to his lab, Thomas Eschenhagen. Thomas went to Germany and has a, a research career trying to take these pieces of artificial tissue, sew them into a, a heart after a heart attack. And, and what, what we focus on is using these tissues as, as uh, environments in which to test fundamental biophysics. So, the, it's pretty simple. We start out, we, we take a chicken egg, pull out some cardiomyocytes, pull out some myofibroblasts, mix them together with some collagen, treat them the right way, and then they end up feeding on their own in a petri dish. And they're ring shaped, so you can't actually quite see it on the screen. There's a, a, a rubber band like tissue construct around a couple of spacers. We can fit those over a, a a force transducer, so a hook connected to a force transducer, an arm connected to a stepper motor, and, uh, a, and, a, and then immerse it in an organ bath. And we can measure a twitch force from these tissue constructs. And we can apply mechanical stretches. And, we can, uh, and you can see that the, the tissue construct actually does beat on its own. So and I won't get into this, but, but uh, my my colleague Ted Wakatsuki has shown that, th that these pieces of artificial tissue replicate some important parts of, of cardiac uh, muscle function. So for instance, this Frank Starling effect. I won't focus on this. What I do want to focus on, and this is going to be the, the, the focus of, uh, of, of the talk. And actually, let's focus on these top two graphs. So these are graphs of a twitch force versus time for two different tissue constructs, two bits of artificial tissue. The black one was made with collagen and as few myofibroblasts as possible to put into the tissue. And you can see that after four days of culture, it, there was a baseline force that was non-zero. So that, that, that's from some myofibroblast pulling. And then there was a twitch force that, that, uh, that, that was on the order of a fraction of a millinewton. The red line is from another tissue construct that had some extra wound healing cells, myofibroblasts included in it. After four days of culture, there's a higher baseline force and more than double the twitch force from the presence of these myofibroblasts. But then if you look a couple of days later, this positive effect of myofibroblasts seems to be gone. 
there's much more baseline force in both tissue constructs, going from 0.5 to 2 here. And, but there's no twitch force in the tissue construct with extra biofibroblasts. Uh, and the, the twitch force is about double in the, in the tissue construct that had as few as we could put in. So uh, let me give you an overview of, of what our approach is and uh, what I'd like to present today. So, so Kai, that was done on the uh, uh, testing device that uh, That was. In vitro. These are in vitro, yes. Okay. And it's, uh, it's not, it's, there's no system yet I know uh, for, for doing this by, by taking out pieces of fibrotic myocardium okay. uh, from, from an animal, for instance. So the, these are the first data that, that uh, suggests to us that myofibroblasts might actually be beneficial in small concentrations, but certainly they can overgrow and wipe out uh, the contractile <coughs> function of these pieces of tissue. All right, so we, we make these tissue constructs. I'm also going to talk about some models that we use to understand what's going on in these tissue constructs. There are two classes of data that we acquire. There are, there are electrical measures and force measures. And they're both important because, uh, in fact, as my colleagues in our uh, biomedical engineering department tell us, uh, pumping action in the heart is actually, for them, called, called uh, motion artifact. They, they, they actually they use brevistatin to knock out contraction to look at electrophysiology. So we, we look at the action potentials on these tissue constructs with electrodes at either end. And we also have some fluorescence method, methods for this. We, we look at twitch forces. We're, we're inter we can look at electrical depolarization using fluorescent dyes. We actually, and and these, are, these are pictures of cardiomyocytes which aren't beating here for some reason. And we, can, and we see these twitch patterns we, from the measurements of, of uh, fluorescence. And then we also uh, can look at uh, tissue level fields of electrical depolarization, both optically and numerically. And we have some technologies for going down to the single cell level and looking at how these, uh, these cells respond. And so uh, it, we have 35 minutes, so at the rate of seven minutes per topic, uh, I'll talk about some electrophysiologic uh, measurements we've made on these tissue constructs, both at the construct level and more at the cell level some mechan uh, understanding the electrophysiologic effects of myofibroblasts, some mechanical effects, and then, and then we're, we don't yet know uh, all the details of how they combine, but we have a course idea that I'll discuss very briefly. And then I'll talk about some uh, pharmacological, pharmacological and mechanical ways that this knowledge could be used to, to possibly uh, devise treatments that, that would help early stage uh, cardiac fibrosis. All right. so. Let me see if this movie works, and if not, we'll very quickly give up on it. This is a tissue construct that's being stimulated uh, at the, uh, the, the stimulated at one end, and is is being, uh, and and then we have voltage, we have uh, uh, electrons coming out at the other end, but there's an ionic current that goes through it. And so this is a very fibrotic tissue construct. These are very difficult experiments. We've only had a few uh, working. We haven't published any of this yet. But what what we see. is nothing. Oh, there we go. So you, you can see that, that there, there's some artifact here. But then you see a spread of excitation across this tissue construct. This is not a simulation. These are real measurements. But you see that the, the wave of depolarization is broken up by, by the presence of myofibroblasts. And, it, and, it, uh, and you actually see uh, something that would be very bad for heart tissue, which is the depolarization wave ends up going two different directions. So it actually separates. And so we built a uh, we've built a series of microscopes to uh, to to look at these. We've uh, and actually I won't, I won't go into these, but we have a very talented colleague named Bill McConaughey who works with it works in Elliot Elson's lab who, who builds uh, microscopes to do this. But we we could also look at the we could see what's going on not just at the level. <coughs> of the tissue construct, we could use a confocal fluorescence microscope and a high-speed camera and, and actually get at the, the individual cell-cell interactions. And so well, there are a host of pathologies that we, can, uh, that we can uncover, even at the cellular level. What I want to focus on is, the, uh, is, is these sets of, of, uh, of measurements, which 
uh, in which we look at regions of cells over tissue. We trace the fluorescence differences over time. And from these, we can get an estimate of how calcium and voltage change as a function of time in these cells. And if we do this at both ends of a paste tissue, we can get, uh, we can get a, we can compare the phase lag between one depolarization pulse at, at, at the paste end, measured one at the other end, and then get a conduction velocity. And here's what happens. So it's, uh, the, the blue lines are the data. So, uh, the, the blue marks are, are data. And we, we see that there's a drop off in conduction velocity as you have more myofibroblasts in the tissue construct. And after a while, the, the conduction stops. So the data are pretty meaningless on their own. However, in the context of models, we, we can actually say something about them. So these lines here are, are homogenization bounds. And uh, I, I presume that there are more people with a mechanical background than an electrophysiologic background here. So these, these, are, these, are, these are the, the conduction velocity equivalent of Hashin Schrickman bounds for, for composite moduli, uh, where, so, where we, we look at, we, we treat the fibroblasts as just insulators, the cardiomyocytes as elements that have a certain conduction velocity, and we see that, that as you increase the volume fraction of myofibroblasts, there, there's a drop in, in modulus which pretty well follows this, this uh, homogenization bound. So the, as fast as you can expect, two scrambled, uh, two scrambled uh, uh, materials to, to uh, interact. But then something interesting happens, which is we get a conduction velocity that's very close to zero after a critical threshold. So certainly with percolation effects, we wouldn't be surprised if we go from the upper bound to the lower bound. But this is outside of the homogenization bounds. So to get a sense of what's going on, uh, we did a series of models. And the, and this is actually quite an intricate model. Tracy Abney uh, took the lead on this. And I, I, we don't have time to go into all the details of it, but I would like you to get the essence of what an electrophysiologic model entails. And so up here, th th this is the, the model we use for a, a, a myofibroblast. This is the Hodgkin-Huxley equation. The idea is we're interested in tracking how the voltage, so, so ionic concentrations, inside the cell change over time. That's related to the capacitance of the cell membrane. And then uh, and also related to how ions go in and out of the cell, uh, both through active pumps and through interactions with the neighbors. And the, the, uh, so this ionic current is a black box here that, that we use. This is something that's enormously uh, complicated. I see I have the wrong reference here. But it's a, it's a Lowe and Rudy, uh, it's the model of Lowe and Rudy, who combined a bunch of rate equations for, for cardiac cells for a specific animal to be able to estimate how ions flowing in and out of the cell affect the, the, uh, affect the, the overall uh, current in and out of the cell. And then the other factor here it comes from having cells neighboring one another. So G is a conductance. And each cell, the, the red cardiomyocytes and these uh, yellow uh, myofibroblasts, have, have uh, connections between them with varying degrees of, uh, of, of conductance. These are all due to a protein called connexin 43. And it's an issue as to whether or not this shows up in natural myocardium between these cell types. But we, we have, and so the, the amount of current going between the cells is a function of the, of the potential difference between the cells and these conductances. Then the myofibroblasts are just simple resistors. So this is one over a resistance, and this is just Ohm's law. And so then if we model a fibrotic region, then we get something like this. And this is a movie of the depolarization wave going across a tissue construct that has a, a few myofibroblasts in it. They show up as as uh, they show up on this voltage map because the myofibroblasts have a different resting potential. And we paste from one end and watch the depolarization wave go through. And as you can see, there, there is just a, a slowdown and a slight roughness to the depolarization wave that shows up because of the presence of these myofibroblasts. So a low concentration before structural effects kick in. 
it, you can really just use homogenization theory. Then, at, then as an example of what goes on at higher concentrations, here's, here's a case where there's a clear structural defect. This is, say, a model infarct region, after this, a, a region of fibroblasts you'd have after a heart attack. You see the, this huge uh, disruption to the depolarization pattern as the wave of depolarization strikes this island of Maya fibroblasts. And this is an experimental system that's analogous to this, although these are just uh, simulation results. And so we, we did a large number of these very slow and tedious simulations and came up with a theoretical graph of conduction velocity as a function of myofibroblast concentration. And, the, and it shows something fascinating. So the, these are now, the, these gray regions are, uh, the, the light gray regions are the two point bounds. Uh, the one point bounds are just the ruled mixtures. And we see as the myofibroblast concentration increases, just like in the experiments, we follow the upper bound uh, up to a critical point. And we see the same bizarre result. We get conduction velocities that are actually outside of the theoretical limits, outside of the bounds uh, over a region. And what goes on here is that, is that there, there exists, right around this percolation threshold, which, which could be explained by passive effects, what we call an active percolation threshold. So in addition to just the, the effects of percolation from cells communicating directly with one another, there are electrical effects in which the myofibroblasts spontaneously uh, <coughs> elicit uh, cardiomyocyte contractions. And then there's a second passive percolation threshold in which these active effects die out, and we subsequently have, uh, we subsequently have conduction inside the, the bounds, as we expect. So these are, these are interesting results, they're, but they're a disaster. Right? They, they don't explain our observation. Our observation was that with a small degree of overgrowth of biofibroblasts, the twitch forces improved. And, then, and, then, and all we see here is that, is that conduction gets worse and worse with more myofibroblasts until it kills you. So we, we also came at this from a mechanical angle. And the, we have some more complicated models as well. But I want to start off with just the simplest possible 1D model and this 1D model really captures the essence of, uh, of what we are, uh, of, what, we're, uh, of uh, what goes on. So th th these, uh, this is pretty much legible. So uh, uh, let me try to step you through it, uh, even though you can't read it. So we, we're just looking at a string of cells. We assume that there are lots of strings of cells next to each other. So we ignore conduction effects. And each one of these cells is a Zaholic, uh, a Z George Zaholic cell, a Zaholic fibroblast or a Zaholic myofibroblast, in which there's an active contractile unit, which is either for myofibroblasts pulling or oscillatory for a heart cell. There's, it's damped. There's, there's a parallel and series elasticity for the cell. And then in parallel with that, there's extracellular matrix. And, so, and then the, the idea is that for the myofibroblast, we, we say that there's just a perfect excitation. It follows a, a, a theoretical form for, for the twitch profile. And, and then we ask the question, what happens when you, have, when you replace more of these, the string of cardiomyocytes with myofibroblasts? And what happens when the extracellular matrix is stiffened by the, uh, by the uh, myofibroblasts? And so without even going to any experiments, we can get this, this range of, of uh, data. So the, and we only, you only need to focus on one of these curves here. Let's focus on this middle curve here. Uh, and this is we're looking at what happens when, when, there, when the extracellular matrix stiffness increases. And we're looking at twitch force. So twitch force increases monotonically with extracellular matrix stiffness. And th this makes sense in, in, in hindsight. If you, have a, if you have a cardiomyocyte feeding on a bowl of jello, you're not going to feel it at the boundaries of the bowl of jello. Whereas if the cardiomyocyte is holding on to two steel rods, you know, you'd be able to sense the, the force. And that's exactly what's happening here. And then the other curve is also intuitive. This is now the twitch force that you can measure from, the, from these cardiomyocytes as you add in more myofibroblasts. And the idea is that as you have more myofibroblasts added, the, the effect of the cardiomyocytes gets watered, out, watered down. But then to actually combine these and do something reasonable with uh, to, to come up with a reasonable prediction, we need to do some experiments. And these are, 
Th these are experiments that we did some time ago, and I'm, I'm going to gloss over most of them, other than to say that these are experiments in which we take a tissue, tissue construct, we stretch it, and hold it, and, and watch, and watch the, how the, the viscoelastic decay occurs. And then we wash out the cells. These are the world's greatest composite materials because you can knock out one of the phases entirely. Repeat the test, and then look at how force changes as a function of stretch and time. And it, it does so in a very clean way. And, and all we're interested in, then, is uh, the, the stiffness at, as uh, over a range of time constants that are important for twitching and over a range uh, these are all different strains over a range of strains that are relevant to what these tissue constru constructs experience. And I, I am going to skip over the analysis other than, that, other than to say that there's a percolation threshold important here as well, a mechanical percolation threshold. And uh, I want to skip this slide too. The, uh, and I want to get to this point, which is that, which is that we, we can then ha get an estimate of how the, the myofibroblasts stiffen these, these uh, stiffen the tissue, stiffen the model my, uh, fibrotic myocardium. And it's, a, it's a monotonic increase. And so the, uh, and over, over the range of interest, it, it's approximately linear. And so, and so we, can get, we can then get out a result in the following way. So let's this, this look only at this contour plot on the left. This is, this is a combination of the two sets of results, of the, of the overgrowth a fibroblast, that's the theta in this way, it's so more fibroblasts here, means a lower twitch force, and ECM stiffness. So higher, higher ECM stiffness means a, a, higher, uh, a, a higher twitch force. And since we know that that stiffness of the extracellular matrix increases with the number of myofibroblasts monotonically, uh, oops, uh, as, a, uh, as, a, as a first pass, we, we can look at a, a line across these contours. Uh, we, don't, we don't know the proper value of alpha, although we can estimate a range. And if we look at this range of alpha, we see that, for, we see that mechanically speaking, ignoring all electrical effects, and ignoring all so two-dimensional, three-dimensional structural effects uh, of the tissue, the, that twitch force increases as, as extracellular matrix stiffness increases with low levels of fibrosis and then crashes down with, uh, as myofibroblasts take over. All right, and, and so it, it seems that from the mechanical perspective, if conduction wasn't an issue, my, the fibrosis would be helpful. So th there's eraser, this is kind of a busy plot. So the, the, uh, the, the blue line here is what I'd like to, the blue solid line is, is what I'd like to start with. So as you increase the volume fraction of myofibroblasts beyond a certain point. There, there's a mechanical percolation threshold at which the, the baseline force exerted by these myofibroblasts increases dramatically. But then if we ignore, if we, uh, ignore conduction effects and ignore the stiffening of the extracellular matrix, then this blue dotted line shows that the twitch force drops off at about the same level. If we, if we, uh, if we look at if we look at percolation effects for the if we look at percolation effects for the uh, electrical percolation effects, then there's an electrical percolation threshold at which the the, uh, the force would begin to drop off. So combining all three, and we only have uh, the data points here are covered. We only have uh, a, a few data points here. We only have four data points. But c combining the mechanical and electrical effects, it seems that looking at this red line, it seems that twitch force actually does start to rise from stiffening of the extracellular matrix just before conduction effects ruin the tissue, suggesting that, uh, suggesting that, uh, <coughs> that, that this trade-off between mechanical and electrical percolation is, is really the, the, the key to preserving the function of, of fibrotic myocardium. All right, so, so, so uh, right now it looks like mechanical percola percolation wins the race. So I'd like to give you an example of a pharmacological treatment. This was, th this was uh, done, uh, this is in a, an article by uh, Tracy Abenikin, and this is the idea of my colleague Ted Wakatsuki, who uh, is from Avivo Sciences in, in uh, Madison, Wisconsin. So he, so he took a tissue construct, which had this range of twitch forces over some interval of time, 
And then he gave the tissue construct a drug. The drug is called cytochalase D. It affects actin polymerization. So in, in the, uh, inside the myofibroblast. So he was effectively, uh, with increasing dosage, knocking out more and more myofibroblasts. And what he sees is, uh, although I didn't trust this first point, what he sees is that there might have been a, a mild rise in switch force followed by a drop. And, and uh, these follow the trend lines from just this one-dimensional model. And the, these, these give an indication that, as, that if we understand the mechanics of how these cells interact, there, there is hope for, for actually designing intelligent treatments and coming up with, with levels, of my, uh, levels of fibrosis uh, maintaining levels of fibrosis that help you help you have an effective heartbeat at high temperature at, at, high, at high pressure without shutting down uh, conduction. All right, and so the, there are 15 minutes left. I'd like to spend those last 15 minutes talking about how we can go, how we can uh, control myofibroblasts mechanically inside the heart. And so the, the overall the strategy here would be at some point in the future after we understand how myofibroblasts uh, change themselves in response to their mechanical environment, is there a way that we can alter their structure early on in fibrosis so that, so that mechanical conditions uh, sufficient for pumping are met and, we, and perhaps the fibrotic overload could be uh, uh, could be uh, maintained at a, at a physiologic level. All right, and so the, the results that I'd like to show are, built, are obtained with this device. This was built by uh, my four students, Adam Nathan and, uh, and Weston Legant, and then Shunlin Lee as well. Uh, and, and this is a device that fits over the objective of a confocal fluorescence microscope. There's a force transducer, there, there's a stepper motor, and then these tissue constructs uh, fit more snugly than this uh, over a couple of loading bars. So we can monitor force and, and apply, uh, a, a, apply a mechanical stretch while tracking what the cells and extracellular matrix are doing uh, in various biochemical and mechanical environments. And the, uh, the protein that we focus on here is, is actin. And, uh, and I think Nate should probably take, uh, take the rest of the talk here because it's, it, the, 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 the world's leading expert is sitting in the back of the room. But, uh, but the, the idea is that we're interested in actin because actin is, uh, actin is what gives the, uh, the uh, actin is what gives a cell its, uh, its, its primary uh, me mechanical function. There, so uh, we, we all know Ning's, uh, Ning's very famous now result that uh, microtubules inside a cell are, are responsible only for a fraction of the equilibration, a tiny fraction of the equilibration of, of actin stresses against the uh, extracellular environment. And so, and, and, and as, we, as we see from this plot that I'll explain, that, that shows up here, that you can actually neglect microtubules in understanding uh, how the cell, how myofibroblasts are responding mechanically. So this is kind of a complicated figure. These are, th th these are actually taken before we had this live cell imaging capability. This is back in, in uh, 2007, 2008 that we did this work. And what we did is we took a tissue construct, we loaded it rapidly, and then watched the force change over time. And that's this gray curve, which I don't think you can actually see, but there's, there's a gray curve that, that drops down rapidly, faster than any viscoelastic relaxation uh, could, could explain, and then rises over, over two different time scales back to uh, something that looks like a target level. And then these, these symbols here are a degree of polymerization of the actin cytoskeletal network. And we see that just ignoring microtubules entirely, just looking only at actin, the, the force, the, the force level, that it, it actually is, is directly proportional to the degree of polymerization of the actin cytoskeletal. And so it's, it's the actin cytoskeletal that's of interest here. And we want to talk about ways that cells respond actively, uh, ways that myofibroblasts in particular respond to mechanical forces to try to understand the rule set that they follow. And a quick word about how we got these data. That this, was, this was actually uh, not, as, uh, not as cruel to graduate students as, as measurements of these characters usually are. Uh, my my uh, uh, former graduate student and now colleague at Washington University, Ali Nakuzadeh, developed 
the, this automatic system to be able to uh, to, to, to take a, a Fourier transform, band pass filter it, and then adjust an image uh, so, to get rid of all sorts of artifacts, and end up with a measure, and we're going to call it fibrosity, but a measure of the total length of features that are the, the size of a stress fiber that show up in an image. And so the, the, and, uh, these and a whole series of test images that, uh, that we just got around to publishing recently uh, really show that we, we get a, a great linear response as long as we treat the image as well. All right, so enough preliminaries. Let's look at real myofibroblasts in a tissue construct stretched, uh, stretched or not stretched in real time. So, and, and these are either going to be the highlight or the biggest disaster of the talk. A lot of pressure on Microsoft here. And the movie works. All right, so this is a myofibroblast I inside a tissue construct that we're not doing anything to. So they're, they're, they're uh, I was not going to repeat that. The, the cells have all sorts of kind of philopodium-like processes. They're not philopodia, of course, but they're different proteins in them. Uh, the kind of philopodium-like processes that, that are going in and coming out. And, and they're, they're very dynamic. Uh, and and the, the, cell, the cell changes its shape. This cell uh, happens to be uh, near, sur near the surface, so it, it has something of a preferred direction. But but uh, but it's continuously probing around to see to see uh, what it can hold on to. Now there's something here that you might not have seen before, and it took us years to be confident that this was not an artifact. But we we can now we're now fully confident. So these bright red blobs here. The, so these cells have m cherry life actin. This is a protein that associates with f actin. So only only the polymerized uh, version of actin. And, and you see these moving all over the place. You'll also notice that they are associated with the, uh, with the, uh, with the growth and retraction of these protrusions. And so we, we call these F-actin reservoirs. And as we'll see in cells that are stretched, cells that, that actively respond to a mechanical stretch, these, these F-actin reservoirs are, are either take up or, 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 or put out a uh, a set uh, put, put out actin that can then be polymerized into a useful form. And so he, here's an example of a cell that's stretched. And what we see is, uh, is oh, it didn't come out clear, there's stress fibers that break initially. And then in response to stretch, we see, uh, we see stress fibers uh, growing in the direction of stretch. And let me see if, you, let me see if uh, I can point, you, point out to you the stress fiber. Uh, I can't quite see it here. You can see it on my laptop. There's, there's stress fibers will, will uh, depolymerize in any direction in these cells, but then they grow only in the direction of stretch. And so that actually gives us the first qualitative rule uh, to, to, uh, to build from. And then, then uh, another qualitative rule is that protrusions get, get withdrawn from in, in any direction, but then they extend only in the direction of stretch. So this is the same cell now monitored following a 5% stretch and a 10% stretch, both well within the physiologic range. And you see, so you see a, a retraction getting pulled in. You see a critical role for these f actin reservoirs. And then, and then as uh, I guess you'll get to see that film. Wait, maybe. So, let's think about it. So you, you see the cell slowly de develop uh, an axis of polarity. And you see the cell slowly develop a preferred direction. All right, so we have lots and lots of these movies. And, uh, and, and uh, uh, oops. But uh, we should sketch some rules. So these are these. Let me force Microsoft to move on. There we go. So they're qualitative rules that we see, and and uh, and these are going to be qualitative rules that are put into a model that is so only have a couple of minutes to describe. But. The, the qualitative rules are that, you, so you've already seen stress fibers depolymerize in response to stretch. We see two classes of, of, of such responses. That we, we categorize them as retraction and reinforcement responses. And that they're grouped because of the, this, uh, this mechanism for automatically detecting degrees of, of actin cytoskeleton polymerization kind of lumps these together, uh, although the F-actin reservoirs are not important. So retraction responses include uh, Retractions of protrusions in any direction, either perpendicular or parallel to the direction of loading. And then you see formation 
of effective reservoirs. Here's a large protrusion that was retracted, which turned into a, a very bright effective reservoir. And then, and then, uh, then, uh, then uh, after some time, so these all occur over a period of time. I'll show you a trace in a moment. We see a lot. We, we see uh, several reinforcement responses. We see growth of protrusions exclusively in, in more or less the direction of loading. We see. Uh, we see stress fibers form, uh, again, in the direction of stretch. And then these F-actin reservoirs shrink. So you can see a big, bright F-actin reservoir turn into a, a series of cellular protrusions. So these are the qualitative, th these are qualitative set of rules. We can quantify these uh, and their time courses using this Fourier-based technique. And, and, uh, we see, and we see three classes of responses. And the first class of response, and these, are, these are from two different cells, we see a, a, sudden, a, a sudden drop in the degree of polymerization. This could be stress fibers or protrusions coming back. But it's mostly stress fibers over this rapid, uh, 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 this, uh, uh, this rapid pre-stretch interval. So this is, this, is, this is several minutes in between. And, and then we, we see maybe a mi mild rise and a drop. This is the biggest example of a drop we saw. We see the subsequent drop due to viscoelastic relaxation. We see a, a, a drop and then a rise, then we see a mono or a monotonic rise. But we never see the opposite. We only see, uh, we, we never see a, a rise followed by a, 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 a subsequent drop. And so we can take these, uh, these elements and build a, a model that, uh, that uh, allows us to test some hypotheses. The hypotheses are, uh, are, that, uh, are the following. So the, the, the rules that we put into this model to be able to predict all of these responses are first, that uh, there exists a, a range of pre-stretches uh, in, in stress fibers. You can ask Ning about this. Uh, uh, so the so so stre stress fibers are are stress fibers are in tension, and, and they and if you if, if you push them, they buckle. If you stress them too far, they rupture. And so there's then there has to be, there's a random distribution that depends on the history of the cell, a, a non-random distribution that depends on the history of these cells. There. And then the additional rules we put in are that this, this peak stress that's experienced near an adhesion site uh, governs reinforcement rates. This is consistent with the Despande model uh, of, uh, of cell mechanics. And then, and then an important feature, which, uh, which differs from what we see in two dimensions in the work of, say, Roland Kaunas, is that these F-actin reservoirs allow instant responses. You don't have to keep track of the amount of, of F-actin in a cell. You always have enough to be able to respond rapidly. And uh, this is going to have to be the, a very short version of the model. Uh, so I can condense this down. So uh, if you just focus on the picture, I think I, I, think I, can, uh, I, I, I think I can go through this quickly. So we look at just idealized cells. They can be spherical. They can be, uh, they can be stellate. Or they can be cylindrical, as is the case here. Uh, and then we uh, we'd start off with a uniform spatial, a uniform distribution of f actin in the cell. So we say that there are stress fibers here. Here they're all, they're all radially oriented. In a stellate cell, they'd all be axially oriented. And, and then within each sector, and we put in enough sectors that it no longer matters uh, in, in the response. Within each sector, uh, we have a different pre-stretch within the allowable range. Then we stretch this cell, and. Uh, with, with, a, with a, an applied stretch uh, lambda. And, and then from our observations, we put bees in these tissue constructs, looked at the motion of the bees, and saw that the Poisson contraction of these anisotropic gels it, uh, gives a Poisson ratio of about one. So, so if you stretch by lambda, uh, if you stretch by epsilon, strain by epsilon in one direction, you strain by epsilon transverse to it. And then uh, let's see how I can get through this in, in fewer than 60 seconds. Uh, so the elements, the, the elements of the following: in each region, there is this degree, this, this fibrosity. So the essence of this is that there, there is, there is a contribution to the to the experimental measure that we have, the fibrosity. So the density of stress fibers in a region, more or less, it it follows this linear linear reaction kinetics uh, towards a, towards a maximum allowable, but modulated by the stress. And so there's that there's some rate alpha, which we just take from other experiments that we've done, take from that, that, uh, that 2007 work that I showed you earlier. And then we, 
and then we say that the normalized stress at an adhesion it, it dictates the rate. The and then the this uh, the stress at an adhesion has an as an elastic and then an active contractile component uh, that that, uh, that that are related to the level of applied stretch. So the, the essence of this is that linear linear kinetics, uh, but except nonlinear in the sense that it depends on stresses. And uh, we can replicate all three classes of behavior. We get only these three classes of behavior. And the, and the, the key factor is the degree of, of randomness, the distribution and pre-stretches that show up in the stress fibers, as a, 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 which, are, are, which is related to the, the, the stretching history of the cells. So if all the, if all the stress fibers are close to uh, the middle of the allowable range, then very few depolymerize, and we, and we end up with some growth of these stress fibers following stretch. And then, it, then at the other extreme, if there's lots of variation and everything's close to the breaking point, either in tension uh, laterally or compression, uh, or, uh, uh, tension actually or, or compression laterally, we end up with most of the cell depolymerizing, and then over the, the time scale that over the time scale that we that we image, very little recovery. And then there, there's a, uh, we don't include viscoelastic relaxation. And then this, th this, uh, this breakage of the structure followed by reinforcement is an intermediate case. And I, I'm out of time here, so, I, so we can replicate the uh, independence of direction as well. Uh, what would I like you to take away from this so is that structure is important in, in, a, in a biological system. Electrically, there, there's a, there are percolation effects, and mechanically, there are percolation effects as well. They compete against one another. The, uh, and then, and then uh, we're a long way away from complete rule sets, but mechanical. But there, there are there is a possibility that we will be able to treat fibrosis with mechanical interventions at some point in the future. And uh, in, I'm out of time, so I will leave up a thanks to Tracy and, and Sheng Lin who did all the, all the work here, and to the the very funding sources. Thanks, Ning. Any questions? And from UC Marcel, any questions, please feel free to raise up. I'll put, put the poor guy on the spot. Thank you for, for sitting through this comfortable <laughs> chair on a beautiful sunny day in Merced, California. <laughs> Can I have a student test question? Sure. <laughs> oh, wait, wait. Actually, are you a student? Yes. Well, I, I think that you trump Tahir. So you, I think you get to go before Tahir. And then not to uh, impose my own rules in order. Go ahead. I would, I would walk. Uh, so when, when you stretch the cells in the initial uh, stage of loading, do the <coughs> stress fibers just rupture, or it's an active depolarization response? So it, it, it's, it, they appear to just rupture. And this is, this is something that, uh, that uh, Jeff Fredberg published as well at, at the same time that we that, that uh, we, we set out our paper. Uh, uh, so, so there really is a rapid depolymerization response, and the the it, it's a uh, there there's a there's a physical bound, and if you stretch quickly, if you stretch quickly, then the then you can actually watch the stress fibers disappear, and we, we can see that we can see that they. Uh, in fact, I I can show you if you're. You don't look like you trust me. Uh, you're a wise man for not doing so. But uh, we can actually see. Actually, I wonder if you can actually quite see it here. It, uh, so you can, you can see. You can see that with that within seconds, uh, uh, within within minutes, uh, uh, of the uh, 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 of, of the stretch, there actually is a, a physical rupture that that uh, that over that that occurs as the the cell just gets beyond the point at which the replacement, as the stress fiber gets beyond the point at which the replacement rates can keep up with, with the stretch. So it's a, it's a very important issue. It took a long time to, uh, to sort that out in the field. Uh, Jeff, Jeff called it fluidization. We got his paper in Nature. Uh, mine, mine didn't. Clarification <laughs> uh, related to this question. Uh, when you say you stretch it fast, what does it do? That's a very good question. So the, the compared to what? Uh, that's so at the upper range of physiologic loading, and so and 
Jeff Redberg has a better example than I do of this. I'm going to use Jeff's example. So Jeff is interested in airway smooth muscle cells, which are related to these cells. They, they come from the same source. They're, they're not wound healing cells, but they're still a pathology of stress fibers. And so the, the, these cells in our, in our lungs are all undergoing uh, this periodic one hertz stretch. And, it, and, and, and that's kind of a baseline uh, level of, of what we have in the body. Our, 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 actually, our, our breathing is about a quarter of a hertz. Our hearts are, are at about one hertz. Uh, and the, the strain rates are, are uh, the strain is, is in the order of 10%. Then, uh, but, but uh, then uh, Jeff's example is that at the upper end, when, when, when we're out of breath, what do we do? When, when we find our, our airway smooth, our, our, uh, our airway closing off, the thing to do is just take a deep breath. In fact, Jeff, Jeff starts his talk asking everyone to, to take a deep breath to make sure there are, there are no pathologies that emerge uh, throughout the talk. The, uh, and, and so, so this, is, this is a breath that goes, say, 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 five to 10 times faster. So five to 10 times outside of the normal physiologic range is, is enough to cause rapid depolymerization. Do we know the uh, stress-weight velocity in these? So we have spent a lot of time looking at that. We, we looked at, mile, at, at, uh, at just waves propagating through, uh, through uh, nonlinear media. Alan Lacuzade, uh, my former student, was uh, now colleague, is the person who leads that. So, the, so it, it seems that, that, uh, the iner that the inertial effects are actually still low at, at these levels. So it, it, the, the, the wave speeds are such that, uh, such that, these, uh, that when you, when you uh, breathe in quickly, there, there's, no, there is, there, there's no appreciable uh, stress wave going through your trachea. And the same is, is presumably true in these tissue constructs by our back of the envelope calculations. So we don't actually pick up, we, we don't actually pick up wave effects with our, with our force transducers. And, and, uh, and our back of the envelope calculations uh, Back of a very, very, very large envelope calculation, uh, 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 suggests that that is correct. That's a, that's a very important issue. So, so in your case, when you have this sudden drop in the uh, conduction level, right, or the force level, as you increase the cardio uh, myofibro bus level, so your argument yeah. was it's competition between the conduction falling because the insulators are more and more uh, versus the stiffness increasing. And the only certain value, it, it uh, suddenly drops. Right? Right. But the model, if you think of a homogenization model, that doesn't explain the sudden drop. Right? A absolutely. So there are. Are we some missing something? Here? But you, you are, and, and it's not, not simply you're missing. It's, the victim always blames himself in these situations. And so, so you shouldn't. Uh, so, the, so I, I realized as I was pre presenting this plot that it, it is indeed an abject failure. Uh, but what, what it's, but it, you're, you're absolutely right that something was missing. And, it, and, it was, and it, it's, it's too opaque from this, this plot. The idea is that, is that over a range, so over, I could, I could try, basically draw another plot with a laser pointer if you could, if you could uh, humor me for this. If anyone has a, 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 a dry erase pen. Uh, <laughs> the the uh, so, so mechanically me mechanically it, it does something like this so so me me mechanically mechanically there, excuse me, mechanically there's a force and this should actually the, 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 there should be there's there's a, a slight rise the slight rise and then a drop and so the, uh, this plot shouldn't be on here this is ignoring effects of the stiffening of the extracellular matrix so w once you reach a percolation threshold then then there's this drop. Then uh, electrically, there, there's, uh, there's a steady decay. So, so, the, so the conduction velocity, uh, which doesn't cleanly show up on this plot, and it was really, it, it seemed like a great idea at the time, but, it, uh, but, but this is a terrible way to, to represent it. The conduction velocity, if there was another plot here, would, would do this, and then, then disaster, then rise back up. And so the, the idea is that that there is a point at which the the overgrowth of of, of myofibroblasts stiffens the extracellular matrix enough to improve the pumping ability, mm -hmm. and 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 to prevent the myofibroblasts from being, from watering down all of the pumping effect. Uh, but and, and this occurs just before 
there are enough myofibroblasts to, white, to knock out the conduction entirely. So, so that, yeah, that, that, that was a very opaque presentation of that. Uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to have one more chance at, at this slide. So conduction is then necessary for the overall tissue to be generating the force. Absolutely. So, so the, and I should actually have said a few words about that. The, the idea is that cardiomyocyte and possibly the myofibroblast, this is something that we're going to be investigating, uh, are, are active tissue, are active cells. They, 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 sense, uh, they, they sense concentrations of, of a series of ions that are conducted from neighbors. And when those concentrations reach a certain level, then, they, then calcium pumps are turned on. And, and, and that, that, that then triggers the contractile response and a certain electrophysiologic uh, response. And it also triggers the neighboring cell. So with, without these appropriate connections and without the, the signal arriving at the right time, the cardiomyocyte can, can, twitch at, at, can twitch at the wrong time. And a significant pathology occurs from what's called a conduction block, which these myofibroblasts seem to be able to provide. And a conduction block can, can slow down the, can slow down the, uh, the growth. And actually, I'll show a conduction block. This movie was meant to be basically a conduction, uh, the beginnings of a conduction block. Here, the, the tissue right behind the conduction block is, is going to twitch at the wrong time. The, the arrival of the wave dictates when the twitch occurs. But it's, if, if it, instead this were a, a much broader conduction block and that, that uh, say, slanted, it would be possible for conduction to start, uh, to start over here and then work its way backwards. And, and there, there's, a, there's a significant pathology, which can be fatal, called a reentrant arrhythmia, in, in, which the, in which the wave of depolarization just keeps going round and round and round, uh, some sort of conduction block. And, and, and so then, when the real wave from your pacemaker cells co comes and, and tries to activate the, the myocardium, the, the, the heart muscle, the, 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 the Cells are still in their what's called the factory phase, phase where they're they're pumping out calcium, getting ready to pump in calcium for the next uh, for, for for the next wave, and so th then uh, they are unable to twitch at the right time. And that that's that is something which, if it occurs in the wrong place in your heart, uh, it does not this shuts off pumping function and it leads to very quick death. So the, is there so. Oh, please go ahead. Yeah. I have a question for the, the actin reservoirs you observed in the cells. So it appears that all those uh, actin reservoirs are located at the end of the cells. Is that true? They, they are actually throughout the cells. And the, so in this one here, you, you, could, you could see that they're actually they're, they're mostly getting absorbed. They're highly mobile. But the, these blobs throughout the cells, these are not imaging artifacts. These, these actually are. Uh, bits of F-actin that, uh, that we first identified five years ago. Uh, you can actually see these, these, these very bright pieces of F-actin. This is a rhodamine phylloidin stain of a fixed, of a fixed uh, tissue. And, and uh, we puzzled over them for a long time and, uh, and, and assumed that this was some sort of artifact. We just went on with our lives uh, because we wanted to race Jeff and get this into nature. Uh, and the, uh, but, but then, then when we saw these here, we knew that we, we had identified that, that it's, when we saw these here, we realized that the, these, that these aren't an artifact of rhodium fluid and staining. And then, then a colleague, Rob Wazelmerski from uh, University of West Virginia Medical Center, has, uh, uh, has uh, actually seen these in quick freeze, deep etch uh, electron microscopy. This is uh, in which, in which uh, a cell is frozen in liquid helium. Uh, it, it, you, uh, and then a cell, a cell is, is, is uh, smashed actually against a liquid, liquid helium hammer. You then etch away the top of the cell, coat it with palladium, put the palladium in a TEM, and, get, <coughs> and actually get uh, images of, uh, of, of actually thing, uh, features at the, at the single nanometer scale. Mm -hmm. That's uh, 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 a technique invented by John Heuser. But we, we see. Uh, so we actually see these reservoirs there. These are, these are real cytoskeletal features that show up for cells in a three-dimensional environment 
which, but do not show up for cells on a 2D substratum. Mm. And the idea is that, is that these, these pictures we see of cells on a 2D substratum are, are of cells that have, have a complete overgrowth of stress fibers, more stress fibers than would ever exist in, in vivo. In fact, stress fibers might exist in vivo only in situations in which, uh, in which cells are undergoing some sort of change. That's something that uh, Rob is exploring. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Rob, you see my set? No. No. It's, it's lunchtime here. That was a good choice. <laughs> <laughs> okay.